Well, well, well. My sustainability journey began when I started, obviously, planting trees some time back. I got the passion for uh, making the environment greener. I want you know stuff to be greener for the next generations, and this is the least I could have done, uh, creating and you know always spending some time uh, with my social groups over there and then trying to plant some trees. That is really nice, Sayam. I share the same sentiment with you. Even I like greener earth, I like planting trees. But, 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 wait. We are at Cloud Native Conference. We are at KubeCon. How it is related to sustainability? How it is related to planting trees? Yeah, uh, that's a very nice question. Uh, Saloni that you asked. So, uh, IT sector is responsible for 2% of the global carbon emissions. And if the numbers are looking small enough, that is at par with the aviation industry. Um, and it is not um, rising at a small, like a steady pace. It is actually rising at a very faster pace. And uh, we as engineers are writing softwares and deploying it to cloud native infrastructure. So this represents us. And that is why we should be talking about sustainability at KubeCon. Oh my God, Sayam, that number is so scary. I didn't even know that we are contributing, we as a software engineer are contributing to 2% of global carbon emissions. That's a lot. And uh, what is the driving factor of this rising rate? Is it the term generative AI? Well, uh, I was thinking not to bring this term, but since you brought it, so yes, uh, it is generative AI. And uh, with the Gen AI that we have seen uh, in the past two years, the steep rise in the data centers, demand uh, is rising. If you take any of the uh, people uh, from the server industry or the data center industry, you will see the orders coming through them is exponential. The NVIDIA GPUs, they need to be placed in the data center. So that is where the data center uh, is increasing. And we only have enough, like so much electricity to power everything, but it's not infinite. We cannot have infinite data centers. But interesting point over here is, uh, it although it is coming in as a challenge, but it also you know, evolves a new wave of innovation because whenever there is a challenge, there will be an innovation. So this challenge of more and more data centers that have to be placed, uh, it has led to a lot of evolution and um, the innovation. Uh, some of the numbers uh, that you can see is uh, for the training emissions of the LLMs. Uh, so GPT-3 has the substantial training emissions of 552.1 tons. And uh, then you have T5 and XLM uh, with some lower. And then you have embodied carbon emissions, which is uh, from the hardware manufacturing. Um, and that is around 24 to 35%. Uh, so these emissions are comparable to the um, to the major sectors, and uh, that's the data by one of the papers, uh, so the carbon footprint of large language models. So this is a paper that you can read. Uh, so that's where the data is actually from. So I get your point now. We as engineers are contributing a lot, and we need to do at least something about it, right? So, okay, now we know it is important to discuss this topic at KubeCon. And we write code, we deploy applications, we deploy to cloud native infrastructure, and we come from enterprise. And everyone at enterprise should think about this. As we are shipping, we are doing the same flow of shipping software. Now, what about the enterprise who wants to contribute to these efforts? How does that matter to them? And how does the CNCF plays a role over here? Do we have anything that I can learn from these projects? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, so if you are coming in from an enterprise, uh, then there's a lot that you'll be able to learn and get from this particular talk. Uh, so one thing which is there is the SCI. Uh, so SCI is basically by the Green Software Foundation. Uh, it's a specification that describes uh, the 
how to calculate the carbon intensity. And um, SCI is you have your uh, energy consumed. So E is the energy consumed by the software systems and the kilowatt hour. Then you have region specific carbon intensity. Uh, then you have embodied emissions that I also showed in the graph, uh, which is the disposing of the hardware. Um, and then you have the functional uh, unit. The R is the functional unit of the work. Uh, so this, this formula, why this formula? Uh, just to showcase that all the challenges, like it's not easy as we write code and how much my code that I have written is contributing towards the carbon emissions that is affecting the environment. It's not easy, but uh, there are researches and uh, there are papers which are being written. There is this Green Software Foundation and then there is uh, CNCF. Uh, so CNCF, um, is Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It acts as a hub for all the Cloud Native projects. That's why we are here. But also within CNCF, there are different tags, which is the technical advisory groups. One of the technical advisory groups is uh, the environment sustainability. Uh, so since you mentioned that we are enterprises and you are coming in from the Cloud Native background, you are deploying the software applications to the Cloud Native infrastructure, how you can learn and what you can learn. Uh, so let me tell you exactly that. Um, so the the main issue, uh, mission and the main goal of the tag sustainability is just similar to what CNCF has, but this particular thing is catered more towards the sustainability side of things. What that means is uh, it has to uh, mainly do with the advocacy of the advocacy, develop and provide support for all the projects uh, that leads the in sustainability in uh, initiatives in the cloud native ecosystem, um, and this. You can see the advocate open source projects, define the sustainability factor, reduce the footprint. So basically two things. Uh, if you sum it down, what we want in the enterprises, like you are in the enterprise, you are deploying your applications to the cloud native infrastructure. One first thing is to observe. So to observe and how we can get the CO2 emissions from wherever you are running, which cloud provider you are running, uh, how you are running your application, your number of Kubernetes clusters, are they running uh, in a resource efficient manner or not, all these things. And next thing is once you get that set of metrics, how to reduce that. So for this, in um, CNCF, there is something which is called the within the tag uh, sustainability uh, under the CNCF, there is something which is the tag, uh, which is the sustainability landscape. Uh, now, this is again not a very fancy landscape like the cloud native sustainability, like the CNCF one, because uh, again, this is very much run by the volunteers. So, if anybody of you want to contribute to the tag, feel free to join it and make it prettier. Uh, but yeah. Overall, you can see there is infrastructure tooling, uh, like you have your Kubernetes clusters and how well you can scale them uh, and how well you can schedule your workloads to the uh, more carbon neutral uh, nodes which are there in the cloud providers, how well you can resource tune them, uh, how well you can do the resource optimization for your Kubernetes cluster and reduce the number of Kubernetes clusters as well. Uh, then you have data centers. Uh, so like I said previously, we have the problem of more and more data centers with the exponential rise in the need for the data centers. What is happening in this space is very interesting. One is the open compute project uh, that has a very smart, intelligent cooling system. Another is the Deep Green project, uh, which I gave a session at the previous KubeCon. Uh, so Deep Green is an organization that uh, reuses the heat coming out of the data centers to heat up the swimming pools and the households. Now that is pretty cool. Why? Because uh, as per their estimates, 97 percent of the heat that goes in the electricity and the power that goes in comes out as the heat and that heat can be reused for the household purposes so they have they are able to uh, create that set of infrastructure with all the oil in place and stuff like that uh, and then if you are running an ai inferencing on a particular cloud provider in that deep green region and if someone is swimming uh, swimming in the swimming pool and it is heated up then it is by that whole process which is there. Now, that is something which is cool and that is the real innovation which is not hypothetical, it is actually happening and in practice, there are cloud providers which are using the deep green region. Uh, next is a little bit highlighting the observability tooling. 
so yes observability plays a very key factor in the whole landscape because we want to observe the carbon emissions uh, for that, we have G Profiler, you have uh, APIs, you have Kepler Project, you have uh, the Green Metrics True Tool, Cloud Carbon Footprint, you have the Telegraph Collector. This one is uh, most limited to the NVIDIA because uh, it is only for uh, NVIDIA specific kind of metrics. Uh, and you have PowerTop and others. Um, then you have the infrastructure tooling that which I was uh, telling so you can um, see the scaling which is happening a predictive vertical auto scaler container level uh, energy efficient VPA recommender Kubernetes Ikeda which is very good in the Kubernetes event driven auto scaling and then you can do the resource tuning with Kubernetes power manager and then using the scheduling uh, there was Q as well which was mentioned I think that can also add to some of the things if you have watched today's keynote uh, in the in the sun sun's keynote with ricardo was uh, showing so yeah that's that's overall on a high level what um, in, in at kubecon like how the whole sustainability story comes in and why cncf had a technical advisory group and why there is a need for the sustainability landscape with the open source projects which are part of it Wow, Sayam, that is quite nice to hear that there is a tag within CNCF that hosts various projects uh, to the environment sustainability. And then you have a whole landscape which is even evolving with new tools. But I am a bit overwhelmed uh, with what you have shown. Can you please narrow down it for me? And can you just tell me if I want to learn, I want to do something today itself, I want to go back and do something today itself, which tools I can use? Well, uh, again, let's narrow it down for you. So uh, let's focus on some of the some of the key projects. And what I'll try to do is I'll try to tell you about these projects, and maybe then you go back and you know do some research and try to implement that. Uh, so one of the project, which is the CNCF project, is uh, Kepler, which is Kubernetes-based efficient power level exporter. Uh, it uses eBPF under the hood, and eBPF lets you run the programs alongside your kernel in the kernel space. Uh, and then the uh, all the metrics that is captured by eBPF is fed to the machine learning model that enriches the data, and then it gives you the exact metrics with respect to the workloads, containers, Linux processes that you are running, um, and exports it as Prometheus format that you can have as Grafana dashboards and things like that. Uh, so that is Kepler for you. Um, so how, how usually you measure the metrics? There are two key things that needs to be measured. One is the capacitance and another one is the frequency. The problem is you cannot measure these directly because uh, capacitance is the number of circuits running for your um, CPUs and when you are running Linux processes, it becomes difficult. So how there you measure is you measure by the number of CPU cycles. Um, for the frequency, uh, the workaround uh, for every circuit frequency is reading from the CPU counters like APER and the other counters. So that's how you measure, uh, that's how the Kepler project measures the capacitance and the frequency which are required to uh, convert them and feed it into the model and then export, at, uh, export that as the uh, metrics. So in Kubernetes, as you might know, uh, if you don't know, in, in Kubernetes, Kubernetes runs on nodes. These nodes are part of, these nodes are the virtual machines or the bare metal instances which are running on a cloud provider or again, bare metal. Uh, it are running pods, pods are running containers, containers are actually Linux processes. So in the end, whatever is running is running as a Linux process on a on your node, which is a Linux host over there. So containers are Linux processes and then everything uh, contribute towards the energy consumption. So your CPU, RAM, GPU, power, everything, every uh, part of it uh, definitely contributes towards the CO2 emission over there. And this is where uh, there are three key areas in the Kepler architecture. So one is gathering, capturing the metric, uh, metrics. So you can see eBPF uh, program generator. So eBPF programs has some of the performance counters, APERF counters and all those. Um, and then it tries to capture all the metrics and then enriches them. Uh, so process name, container ID, uh, perf counter stats, adding all those. Uh, and then the second layer is the aggregation layer, which is the energy stats reader. Uh, on the bottom, you have four things. So you have RAPL uh, that captures from the Linux. Uh, it, it 
actually gives you the right estimates of the power uh, which is being used by this particular Linux um, in, the, in that particular process. And then you have the uh, power-based uh, energy estimates. You have hardware monitor sensor. You have GPU, uh, NVML that gives you the direct metrics. And these all then also gets feeded. Now, this is one part. Next part is going that to the uh, ML model. So there are, again, two ways. One is the internal machine learning, uh, which is offline model, and one is the online model. So when you install Kepler, it gets installed as a daemon set, and uh, in that daemon set, there is a very small embedded, uh, pre-trained, fine-tuned uh, model itself that can do the inferencing uh, for the data that it's being sent to. So there is one layer of metrics that goes to ML model, and then it enriches and tries to find out the CO2 estimates with respect to the metrics and then again export. So you can see it is again exporting it as the uh, Prometheus metrics. And then you can query either Prometheus directly or you can feed that to uh, as a data source inside Grafana and view the uh, dashboard. So that's, that's the Kepler project for you. So Kepler project with Kepler project, if you install on your Kubernetes cluster, you'll be able to get the metrics, you'll be able to observe your namespaces, your pod, per pod metrics, per namespace metrics, and you'll be able to get the estimates, what is happening in my cluster, how it is behaving uh, in terms of the carbon emissions. The next project that I want to highlight is Cube Green. Uh, Cube Green is another open source project. And it is basically for an operator that you install on the Kubernetes cluster to reduce the carbon footprint of your clusters. What happens is uh, you have, um, obviously you said you're coming from an enterprise. So I assume that in an enterprise, you will be having a lot many organization, uh, like a lot many teams. For each teams, you will be having dev, test, stage, prod, all these environments. And each of the environments must be multiple Kubernetes clusters that are given to the teams. Um, but do we really uh, you know, consume everything, all the resources from a dev environment, test environment? Maybe stage, yes, definitely prod and pre-prod, we definitely use them uh, 24 by 7. But we do not need our environments to be up and running or our workloads to be up and running, at least for the dev environments, 24 by 7. So whatever we are running over there, we are wasting the resources. And these resource wastage causes uh, the CO2 emissions. Actually, it also uh, in incurs a lot of cost. But uh, since the talk is about sustainability, so if you are able to achieve the sustainable path, you are automatically achieving the path of reducing cost. So um, what happens is uh, there are thousands of pods running and causing emissions. Uh, this is where Cube Green comes in. Yeah, this is some uh, calculator that they have on the website. Uh, so you can see um, with the assumption um, that it's a two node CPU cluster and it's using 100% green electricity uh, and it's uh, 11 kg CO2 per year per pod. Uh, that's the estimates. So how you can use Cube Green here is uh, you go and install Cube Green on your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it will install a, uh, install as an operator. Uh, an operator means you will be able to create a custom resource. Now that custom resource in this case would be sleep info. So you create a sleep info custom resource and that you can create in namespace. So if you see kind is uh, sleep info, you have a name, you can add a namespace. Uh, you can apply that on weekdays, like uh, on all the weekdays, I want my particular deployment and cron jobs. Right now it works for cron jobs and deployments. So I want this to sleep at 8 p.m. and wake up at 8 a.m. And you can specify the time zone and if you want the cron jobs to be suspended or not. Next section is important because you might have some workloads which you really want to be running 24 by 7. So you can exclude ref. So you can say, I want to uh, sleep all the stuff within a given namespace, all the deployments. But I want to exclude a certain um, deployments to be uh, do not to be sleep, uh, slept away. Uh, so that's where you will be able to use uh, Cube Green. So you have deployment, uh, it goes to sleep, replicas are set to zero. And whenever it wakes up, replicas are set to the number which was there before the sleep. For the cron job, uh, it sets as suspended. And then uh, when it's time to wake them up, it's uh, the suspend field is removed. Uh, the state of the resource before the sleep is stored as a secret so that it knows in that same particular um, namespace. Um, and I promise this, this is the last one. Uh, so the last tool is, um, because I really want 
you to you know just gather everything and do something uh, so cloud carbon footprint is an open source tool that provides the visibility for the tooling uh, to measure monitor and reduce the cloud carbon uh, emissions and uh, you can see yeah uh, so you can see that emissions break down. So let's say you have multiple cloud providers, you hook them up into the uh, cloud carbon emission once you have that. I, again, it's also open source, uh, and you'll be able to get the estimates of GCP, Azure, or whatever cloud providers you are using, uh, if they're exposing that metrics, if they're able to connect to that. Uh, all the major cloud providers are. So you'll be able to uh, get that sort of uh, metrics. Okay, thank you, Sayyam, for this. I'm sure I'm going to implement this. So, well, Sayam, I'm back. And do you know, I went back and actually spent some time for my personal project. And I also done it for my Kubernetes clusters running in different environments, as you suggested, dev, prod, test. Would you want to see what I did? I would love actually. to see what you have implemented and uh, see what scenarios you have for us. So this is scenario one. So here, this is my home set up and I have a Raspberry Pi. It is running on Kubernetes based on K3S. The small issue at my place where I live is, uh, there is certain times where farmers burn the crop and it really causes so much of pollution. And then uh, the crackers add on to that pollution. So I wanted to check whether I really need air purifier, but I really, I got one actually. <laughs> so. Uh, I wanted to measure the air quality index of my particular location. I know we can use regular channels to know about this, but this is specific to my house and location. So I needed something more native to this, where I am located. So what I did, did is here, I installed SDS 011 sensor, and I created a Python script, running it as a pod on the cluster, using SDS 011 query reader and exporting that metrics using the Prometheus SDK, and then getting the air quality index, AQI, data as Grafana dashboard. So this, is, this was my first scenario, which I implemented when I got back. And okay, so you already did it for your home. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> and I was able to measure air quality index. It was really bad, it was 150. <laughs> so I really need to, uh, look on that. So this coming to the second scenario, uh, this is more of uh, my enterprise solution related to my enterprise. Uh, I have created this scenario based on the tools what you have shown. So I have Kubernetes cluster in different cloud providers and then I used uh, cloud carbon footprint to hook them in and get the emissions from that. Still I wanted to know uh, the carbon emissions from within my cluster. So what I did is I used Kepler, which you mentioned previously, which is installed as a daemon set on the Kubernetes cluster. And then I was getting the fancy dashboards on Grafana. So uh, do you want to sh see it in action, how it actually looks like? Yeah, let's, let's actually look that. So I'll show you all a small demo on this. Need to escape the present and then yeah. So I won't be able to see what I'm typing. <laughs> no, no worries. I'll just type. Just let me know if it is visible. Okay. Yep. So we see a three-node cluster. Yeah. Uh, 
I am not able to see actually. Yep, I see the Kepler demon set. Okay, so this is Kepler demon set. Yep. Now, actually, I'll do the port forward and we'll be able to see our Grafana dashboard on my local host. So, <laughs> this is how the Grafana dashboard looks like. Yep. Awesome. So, so you can see total power consumption uh, per namespaces, like for Cert Manager, how, how much it is for default, Falco. So this is how uh, we can see the whole view. Now we need to switch back the presentation, I think. Yeah, so this is the most difficult back. task. <laughs> most difficult task. Uh, I don't even know where it, where it went. Just, just minimize this. it. Ah, okay. Now we have. I can't see present. It's on the right side. Is it working? No. Up, up. Right, right, right. Yes. This? Yeah, I think First, I can. Second. Yeah. Press it. Uh, down, down, down. Yes, present. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. This works. Yeah, we don't get to see that now. Okay, uh, so you did uh, the Kepler and you also did uh, your home setup and you had this. Uh, did you try the cube green one? Yeah, so this is the third scenario. So I have this three node cluster over here and I, I tried uh, measuring the CPU usage. Yeah, so there. I see you have installed, uh, uh, you already have Kepler, so you are getting the metrics from there and then you have cube green that you have installed and you have the sleep info uh, pod which is which is being created yeah i think that's that's cool uh, so you you were able to at least go and implement all the tools cloud carbon footprint kepler and cube, cube green um, within your uh, not only your home environment i mean not in your home environment but in the enterprises but you also did some cool stuff fancy stuff with the sensors and all that stuff which is cool uh, so one thing I want to showcase more is uh, the application level things. Uh, so I, I guess you might be having that too many cluster problem as well. Um, so you still have, you are doing all the stuffs, but there are still too many clusters. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, for each team, you are handling over the clusters for, for team A, team B, team C, you are handling over, uh, handling them uh, different clusters and you do not only give them clusters, you install different toolings on that. So each cluster has its own control plane, each cluster has its uh, own control plane cost, each cluster has will have a cert manager, so there'll be, if there are four clusters, there are four cert managers, if there are four clusters, there are four Nginx controllers, if there are four clusters, there are four um, vault and whatnot applications. Uh, so to solve this problem, and this problem is very uh, interesting, is to reduce the number of clusters, there's this concept called uh, Kubernetes multi-tenancy. And then there is a project called vCluster. So what vCluster helps you do is, uh, it helps you create uh, virtual clusters uh, as uh, from your host cluster. So previously, like you were having two clusters, now what you will be having is, you will be having a single cluster where you will be having some host components. Those host components can be Argo CD, Vault, Nginx Ingress controllers, and then virtual with virtual cluster, you will be able to slice the Kubernetes clusters, and you will be able to get those virtual clusters. And these clusters have their own control plane. So instead of multiple cluster per tenant or cluster per team, it becomes control plane per tenant or control plane per team. Because in the end, it's the control plane that matters, not the number of clusters. Because what your team wants, 
your team just wants a kubeconfig file and they are able to access the cluster and they feel they are the admin just as you create a virtual machine from a cloud provider and you log in and use you, you have full superpowers but it is actually running on a bare metal and shared with all the others and others are also create able to create the virtual machine over there same concept uh, virtual clusters are the slice of the Kubernetes clusters. When you get the kubeconfig file, you are able to completely uh, get the control of that. And you do not get to see, like in VMs, you do not get to see what on stuff, what, what is bare metal, you are not able to access that. Similar to that, you won't be able to access the host cluster. So if you are accessing the virtual cluster, you are just the owner of the virtual cluster and you are not able to access the host cluster. And on virtual cluster, you can install any of your applications, any of your tools. So for your teams, it is still a Kubernetes cluster, a CNCF certified Kubernetes cluster. But for you, it is less number of Kubernetes clusters, which means um, it is creating more sustainable ecosystem for your uh, Kubernetes clusters. So that was us. Um, my name is Sayam Pathak and uh, I am the CNCF Tag Sustainability Lead and you can uh, currently I'm working as Principal Developer Advocate at Loft Labs. We are the creators of vCluster so if definitely if you want to learn more about that you can chat with me or come to the booth A6 um, and also uh, you can add that it's Sayam Pathak. You can follow me <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I'm not able to see here because that's why I have to sneak in. So hello everyone, my name is Saloni Narang. I am CNCF ambassador, co-founder of Cube Simplify. You can connect me over on my Twitter channel that is I underscore Saloni 92. And we would really love to have your feedback on our talk and any questions. Yeah, if you like the story, uh, <laughs> I hope you did. Uh, uh, so you can give us the feedback um, and hope you are also able to get something out of the session, go back and try to implement uh, Kepler, KubeGreen, vCluster, um, Cloud Carbon Footprint, some of the projects that we discussed today uh, within your enterprises. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we have a couple of minutes for question if anybody wants to ask. Uh, yeah, very, very good question. Uh, the network, uh, there are no tools right now that I'm aware of within the landscape uh, that measures the carbon footprint of networking uh, because networking is costly. And uh, we, so what we need, I gave a talk uh, at 11.30. So we need more uh, domain level expertise over here, people who can you know, understand uh, that particular layer pretty well and also understand the science behind calculating those carbon emissions so that we can get good metrics. Uh, there are some papers that are circulating in the Slack channel of CNCF, uh, but no concrete project that I have seen that specifically measures that. So I think that's, uh, that is something which is uh, missing uh, as, of, as of today. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for attending our talk and uh, I'll be here. See you around. You can catch me in my jacket or at booth uh, A6 at Loft Labs. Thank you. Thank you.